Well, good evening, friends. It's good to see all of you again, uh, many of you. Uh, it's been a while since I have seen you, but it's a joy to share uh, the Word of God with you, to minister this truth to you. For those of you who don't know, my name is Nate Pickowitz. I'm the pastor of Harvest Bible Church in Gilmanton Ironworks, New Hampshire. Uh, we planted that church uh, almost 10 years ago, and just grateful for God's provision, His, uh, His kindness to us, and just to find uh, other like-minded church churches. Uh, Pastor Gabe and I have been friends for several years, as long as, as well, the elders at this church is also, and just really grateful for the partnership and the gospel that we have, and just thankful uh, for your faithfulness here in this location. I just love driving up and seeing that massive sign. That was so good, uh, where, where God's glory can be uh, extolled and churches will thrive. Well, every so often I'm asked about the application of Scripture as a pastor. People ask me, how do I apply this? How do I apply that? And really, when you contemplate it, application is nothing more than taking a biblical truth and using it properly in your life. Now, it's been said that in the realm of application, there are two main purposes, two purposes. There are some things that God simply wants you to know, things he wants you to know, other things he wants you to do, things to do. We oftentimes associate application with the do. We, we think that uh, because we have marching orders, we have something to engage in. They help us measure faithfulness to God. However, it's my conviction that the know, K-N-O-W, the know is much more transformative than the do. See, the command to do simply changes your behavior. But the command to know, it informs your mind, it transforms your heart, it reforms your actions. And in knowing God's truth, our hearts are changed and faith is built. So the question is, well, why do I point this out? Why is this important? Because when it comes to preaching the person of Christ, let me just move this here, preaching the person of Christ, there is attached to it an explicit command for us to know and believe, to know and believe. Because how does knowing more about Christ affect you from day to day? And you might think to yourself sort of off the cuff, well, that's, that's great for a Sunday evening sermon, but what do I do for my Monday morning problems? Well, I want to tonight look at all of the problems of the world, all of the corruption of the world, all of the wickedness that exists, and bring all of it to Christ. And so with that, we're going to be working from Psalm 2 this evening. Now, by way of introduction, I would say that as long as there has been society, there has been sin in this society. The powers of hell rage against every gen- or in every generation, in every nation, and there's not a single people in this world that are immune. And the world, in all its devices, sets itself up in rebellion against God and shakes its fist. And, and I'm sure you've already seen this, but even in our own country, we see that the, the moral fabric of our society is beginning to unravel and degrade. And really, the sexual revolution of the 1960s unleashed a wave of immorality that has not been seen since the days of Rome. No-fault divorce is as common today as a parking ticket. Promiscuity amongst young adults is soaring, and the age of that gets younger and younger. There's all kinds of other agendas in this world, and I, can, I could share them all with you, but I'll protect the young ears in the room. All of this just feeds more and more on itself a fleshly behavior, a fleshly lifestyle, a morally bankrupt culture that is digressing so fast, plagued by addiction, laziness, entitlement, self-importance, depression. It rages against the authority that is set in place to govern over it. And why not? Because the government oftentimes isn't much better. We're plagued by politicians that lie and extort and who will do anything to stay in office. In many cases, they profit from the very problems they create. Washington has widely become known as a seedbed of immorality and corruption and debauchery, and that's just based on what we're allowed to find out about on the news. And the media has been controlled by progressive businessmen. This is not a big secret. And there's a, an ideology, a worldview. They tell us that we're not, we're not supposed to have our faith in the public square. Well, they have their faith in the public square. That's called secularism. Secularism is just as much a religion as any other. Truth is relative. Facts don't matter. Intellectual honesty is an anachronism. 
And all of it exists to keep a steady stream of cash flow going to the pockets of those in power regardless of the cost. And so in the name of all of this, debauchery, sexual liberty, economic depravity, all of this, our cultural mind is willfully inconsistent and it finances itself on sinfulness. We impoverish the poor. We coddle the rich. We abuse the innocent. We reward the unrighteous. We steal from the honest and give to the entitled. And despite the fact that the vast majority of Americans are either passively or actively contributing to the problem, we're the first to grumble and the first to complain when all of this injustice exists. We feast on hours and hours of news media and social media and programs and YouTube videos, and we stress and lament about the state of the world, that it's falling apart and it's corrupt, and yes, it certainly is. However, what are we to think about when we see all of this? What are we to do when we become overwhelmed with anxiety and fear about what's going on around us, when we see persecution on the rise in many parts of the world, when we see rights and freedoms being taken away, money uh, blowing up in our face? What do we do? Because the, the knee-jerk reaction for most people, Christians included, is to panic and to fear. But the Bible teaches us that there is another response based on what we are to know, based on what we are to know, and that comes to us in Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is what is known as a royal psalm, a royal psalm. It's written sometime around 1000 BC and illustrates the coronation of the king of Israel. Now, while it's not attributed here in Acts 425, it tells us it's written by David, and it is really in the normal, immediate context, we understand this is the, the written about his, his own coronation. He's talking about himself in some regard. But there's a, a deeper meaning going on in Psalm 2, as we're going to see. And I want to look at this together with you. So Psalm 2, we read this. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. But he said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence, and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he be not, not become angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled, how blessed are all who take refuge in him. Amen, Amen indeed. Now, this psalm, again, written from the, in the form of four stanzas, if you will, four stanzas. And on our time tonight, I want to really look at these four stanzas. Each stanza has three verses. We're going to work through each stanza one at a time. And so I want to give you just a very simple outline, a simple outline. Number one, we're going to see the rebellion of the nations. The rebellion of the nations. The psalmist begins with really a question. A question. And he asks this. Why are the nations in an uproar? And the peoples devising a vain thing. Why? And we look around the world and there's wars going on and rumors of wars and all kinds of problems. And the nations seem to be in this uproar. And the, the psalmist is asking why? Now, based on what follows, we know that this is really a rhetorical question, and as we see in the context, this is even a sarcastic question. This is sarcasm. And he asks the question referring to the nations. In the Hebrew, it's the word goy, nations. It refers to any nation of people that is not Jewish, so pagan. So the, the pagan nations, and really the reference is applied universally. It's any nation. But he notes here that the nations, the peoples, are in an uproar, an uproar into tumult or commotion, as you could render it. It can also refer, this word can be translated or, or rendered something in, the, in the, the family of conspiracy or plot. Why are the nations plotting? Why are the nations conspiring? Why are they in an uproar, commotion, 
tumult. And some translations render this simply rage. Why are the nations raging and the peoples devising a vain thing? The sense of the Hebrew here is that they're, they're conspiring to do something that in the end is going to become vain or empty. It's a fool's errand. They're, they're wasting their time devising this thing, whatever it is. And David asks, why are you doing that? Why? Implying that it's the, it's the nations that are doing it. And then he zeroes in specifically on world leaders. Look at verse 2. He says, the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Kings, rulers, that's all inclusive. You could add to that prime ministers, presidents, anybody in authority, a position of power, kings and rulers, all rulers. It's interesting to think that not all of the rulers in the world like each other. In fact, many of the world leaders today don't like each other at all. Some do, some don't. But what's interesting to note here in the text is that he's describing this point when all of these rulers, even though they might not like each other, they take counsel together and they all stand together against a common enemy. You've heard the phrase, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Well, that's what the world does in regards to their stance with the Lord and his anointed. They take counsel together. And who is the one enemy that every wicked ruler is joining forces against? He's very clear. It is against the Lord and against his anointed. The Lord, Jehovah in some renderings, is the proper name of God. This is the self-existent one. This is Yahweh. Kings and rulers, they not only stand against God, however, they also stand against his anointed. Well, who is his anointed? This word for anointed is Messiah. It's transliterated for us, Messiah. And the Greek form renders in the, in the New Testament as Christos or Christ. Now, God's anointed could technically refer to any Jewish king, any earthly king, the anointed one who's next to take the throne. Whoever the king of Israel at that time, who's in power, has certainly been anointed with oil and had the, 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 the crown on their head and they're seated on the throne of, of power. But looking beyond this, we see that there's a greater context, a greater application, and the greater finality of this, the greater fulfillment of this, is actually the anointed one, the capital A anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. We're talking now about Jesus of Nazareth. The Christ is the second person of the Trinity. He is truly God and truly man, the Son of God. And so these raging nations, their stubborn stance is set up together, not just against God in general, but against a specific directed person, that is Christ. They are taking their stand together against Christ. And what do they say in their rebellion? What is their chorus? Look at verse 3. They stand together and they say, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Fetters and cords are the bounds that hold an animal or a slave in place. It's representative of the yoke of God's kingship, his rule on us. See, these fetters and cords, these are restraints of God found in his law, certainly morally and ethically. They're his righteous commands. So God, the sovereign Lord, is telling the nations what they can do and what they cannot do. Sometimes nations obey, and we've had seasons of our history where we have obeyed some of these commands. But many, many, many times, the nations do nothing except rage. For the the vast majority of world history, the nations have only ever raged against Christ. And once in a while, a nation bows the knee. But they scream at him, and they scream and they shout, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. We hear today people want to be free to sin. They don't want anyone to tell them otherwise. You you tell someone that, no, that's, that's not what God wants for you. You say to a person, that's sinful behavior. And what do they do in response? Well, they'll either give you a, a series of choice words or choice gestures, but they'll, they'll rage against you. And even now, in the culture that we're in right now, if you say anything contrary to what someone feels or thinks, they'll use that and they'll call it hate speech. 
They'll say, you, you're, you're hurting me. I'm telling you the truth. And yet, they will rage against anyone who will tell them the truth. And yet, we are simply sinful messengers of God redeemed in Christ. What do they say to him? What do they say to him? Now, they want to throw themselves on the ground and act like petulant children and throw temper tantrums against God and against Christ. We see this even in Luke 19, 14. The people cry about Christ. He will not, we will not have this man reign over us. They are indignant and stubborn. We will not have this Christ over us. So much so that they actually kill him. We know this in gospel history. But David says that all of this uproar and devising and plotting and conspiring, he says it's a vain thing. It's a fool's errand. And how does God respond to this raging of the nations? Number two, the reply of the Father. The reply of the Father. Verse four, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Now, I want you to stop and think about this. The world rages in chaos. They are drunk in debauchery, conniving in corruption, engorged in violence and murder. And the kings and rulers and governments and armies of this world, they all join together to attack the Lord, to to blaspheme Christ, to kill Christians if they have opportunity. Their ultimate goal is to eliminate Christianity from the face of the earth. That's the goal. And in the face of all of this raging and anger, what happens here? The Lord laughs. He laughs. This is strange, isn't it? This is unnerving. Frankly, my friends, this is terrifying. Because not only does he laugh, he scoffs at them. He scoffs at them. He he mocks them. He ridicules them. Why? Why does God mock and ridicule all the nations who rage against him? Because he's God. He's God. Isaiah 40, verses 22 and 23. He says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them all out like a tent to dwell in. It is he who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. How would you respond if you were to walk outside your backyard and see the grasshoppers in your lawn staging a mutiny against you. What would you do? I would laugh. In fact, when my grasshoppers do it, I mock them. But that's what you would do. You would mock, you would laugh and say, this is the most foolish thing in the world. My grasshoppers and my insects and my vermin staging an insurrection against me. But that's the imagery that we have. Psalm 59, 8 says, the Lord's enemies are like dogs howling and belching forth from their mouths. But the Lord, it says, the Lord laughs at them. He scoffs at all the nations. And then we see where he goes next. He goes from laughing and mocking in verse 4 to anger and wrath in verse 5. Look at verse 5. He will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. This word for anger is af in the Hebrew. It literally means nostrils or nose. And and the reference here, the the imagery that we see, it's a reference to a violent snort of anger. It's it's a grunt of contempt from the nostrils. And it says that that's the way in which he's speaking to them. He he will speak to them in his anger, his from his nostrils. And what is the effect when he does this, when he he, he speaks to them in his anger? The Bible says that he terrifies them in his fury. He will terrify the nations in his burning anger and fury. He terrifies his enemies. We see this all throughout the judgments described in Revelation. You read the book of Revelation, it's there. People running and hiding from from all of the judgments of God. Grown men fainting with fear. Begging for the rocks to fall on them and crush them because they're so afraid of God. When the Lord is angry, no one can stand. 
Psalm 5.5 5 says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. That's speaking of the Lord. Psalm 7.11, the, go- the Lord is a righteous judge and God who has indignation every day. Let me ask you, do you think the wicked are getting away with anything? It's so easy for us, isn't it, friends? To look at the world, to look at what's going on, to see injustice, to see corruption unchecked. And to think to ourselves, well, that's not fair. They're going to get away with that. Romans 2.5 notes that the wicked, because of their stubborn and unrepentant heart, are storing up wrath for themselves for the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. God is watching. God is keeping track. And he's storing up wrath for the wicked. And what does the Father say to all of this? Because the Father speaks in verse 6. This is the Father speaking. He says, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. God's response to sinful rebellion and anarchy of the nations is then, it's, this is remarkable, he seizes on the rebellion of the nations to then announce the enthronement of the Son of God, the King. He says, I, in the I in the original is emphatic. I have installed my king. I have installed my king. Again, the immediate context here is certainly the Davidic king, but for God's supreme purpose, he's he's talking about the eternal enthronement of Christ. Notice that he speaks here in the past tense. I have installed my king. It's already done. So the Lord Lord God is not waiting for what's going to happen with the nations before he acts. He's already acted. He's already done this. The nations are raging, thinking that they're somehow going to overthrow the Lord God and overthrow his will and prevent his reign. But he's saying it's already done. It's as good as past tense. Charles Spurgeon has said God has already done that which the enemy seeks to prevent. I love that. There's nothing that can be done. This is inevitable. This is as sure as the word of God. But God has installed his king, he says, upon Zion, my holy mountain. Zion is the spiritual name for Jerusalem, but broadly it refers to all of heaven and earth, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, when God is reigning over that. So Christ the king is already enthroned. He is king. And then we hear from Christ. Look at number three. The victory of the son. The victory of the Son. Verse 7. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, this is Christ now, He said to me, you are my Son, today I have begotten you. Immediately we see the Son here base His enthronement on the decree of the Lord. It's already as good as done. It's steadfast. It's immovable. He says, He, the Father, said to me, the Son, you are my Son. And today I have begotten you. This directly connects us to what is known as the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant. Part of God's promise to David is that he would create a posterity for David and keep a king on the throne forever. In doing so, the Lord says in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. Psalm 89, 27 echoes that very same thing. He says, I also shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Firstborn doesn't mean age. It means preeminence. It means position. Christ is preeminent over all. He is first. He is uncreated. He is of all high preeminent status. Now again, this generally is referring to the earthly Davidic king, but Acts 13.33 says that God has fulfilled this promise to our children and that he raised up Jesus, so it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, I have begotten you. Furthermore, in Hebrews 1.5, it makes the direct connection between Psalm 2.7 and the Davidic covenant. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him, he shall be a son to me. He says, to who else did he ever say that? The answer is nobody. And the question is, well, why is this so important? Why is this so important? Because this puts on display the profound truth that God has no intentions of baptizing any world ruler to govern the earth. 
Rather, he has set up the throne of his eternal son, the Christ, the king, who will reign forever. So we're not waiting for some earthly king, some earthly president, some earthly prime minister. We're not waiting for someone from here. We're waiting for someone up there to come here and do what he's already said he has done. And that is establish his throne forever and reign. And then we see in verse 8, the father's gracious gift to the son. Look at verse 8. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as a possession. Now, we're seeing here, this is remarkable, we're getting an inside scoop here to the discourse between the father and the son. It's almost like we're putting up a a glass to the wall and listening to the conversation of the father and the son right here. This is a, a discourse between the two of them, and the father is giving to the son an inheritance. Now, we know from the Gospels that, that the Father gives the elect, the church, to the Son for his own possession. We read about this in John chapter 6. Just listen for a second here. Jesus says in John 6, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given to me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. Christ has declared that the Father has given to him the possession, an inheritance, a people. We are the possession, the inheritance, the privileged gift from the Father to the Son. He says it again in John 10.29, he says, the Father has given sheep to me. He says it also in John 17.24. Titus 2.14 says, the Christ redeems the people for his own possession, those who are zealous for good deeds. Over and over and over again, the same refrain. The bride of Christ is a gift from the Father to the beloved Son for his own glory. We belong to him. But here in Psalm 2.8, the son gives even more. He's given even more. Not only the, the bride of Christ, but we see here as ruling king, the sovereign despot, if you will, he receives the nations, even the very ends of the earth as his possession. In other words, when he comes again, Jesus will have for a possession everything. He owns every nation. Abraham Kuyper famously said, I love this, listen carefully, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. John 17, 2, Jesus prayed to the Father, Father, glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you have given him authority over all mankind, that to all you have given him, he may give to them eternal life. So Christ the King receives all peoples, all nations, to those who believe he gives them eternal life. What about those who reject him? Because there will be many, many. Read Matthew 7. Jesus, in a terrifying sentence, says, there will be many on the last day that will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do wonderful works in your name and cast out demons in your name? And what does he say to them in response? Depart from me, I never knew you. That is the most terrifying, sobering thing I think I can recall in Scripture. Of the Lord Jesus looking at a person who thinks they're going to heaven and saying, I have no idea who you are. Get away from me. But what does Jesus say? What does Christ say to those who rage against him? Verse 9. To Christ the Lord says, You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Two descriptions are given of the same action here. So he's saying the same thing in two different ways. Number one, he says that Christ... Because the Lord God is telling the Son, the Christ will break them with a rod of iron. A rod is a symbol of God's judgment. In fact, in both Leviticus 27 and Ezekiel 20, the rod is seen as a, a shepherd's crook. The same shepherd's crook that's used to manage and care for the sheep is also used to strike the attacking wolves. But the Lord will break rebellious peoples 
And the second metaphor, number two, he will shatter them like earthenware. He will break them like brittle pottery when they stand against him. And so on the day of judgment, rebellious kings and nations will not stand. They will, they will be broken and shattered by the Lord. And we read on, about this on that day. 2 Thessalonians 1.7 says, The Lord Jesus will deal out retribution on those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, from His glory and the glory of His power. Revelation 19.15 says that He will smite the nations with a sharp sword. He will rule over them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And so my question then for us is why are we worried about what's happening in the news? Do we have no faith? What do we have to worry about? What do we have to fear? God laughs at our enemies. He scoffs at those who hate us. And He will pour out wrath on those who seek to harm us. Beloved, let me encourage you. Your great shepherd cares deeply for you. He cares for you. And He is more, more than capable of judging righteously and preserving His people. And the nations, they may try to break His bonds, but Christ will break them and shatter them into pieces. And so what is to be done? What do we do? What is the takeaway here? Because up to this point, it's simply to know. We are to know these things. What is to be done? Just one thing. Heed the warning. Number four, the warning of the Spirit. Now some have seen this last stanza as being the voice of the Holy Spirit. And if that's true, then we see the Father speak in verse 6, the Son speak in verses 7 through 9, and the Spirit speaking in verses 10 through 12. Certainly interesting. Thus providing a, a Trinitarian presence in Psalm 2. But I want you to notice that instead of concluding with divine judgment, the Lord gives an opportunity, an opportunity for repentance and faith. And so we see here five commands, five commands given by God. First, comes in number 10. He says, Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Be prudent. Old translations say, Be circumspect. Be wise. Even kings and presidents can be wise to the things of God and do all they can to reverence Him. And so that's what he says. He says, Show discernment. The second thing, Take warning, O judges of the earth. Even human law courts can show respect and abide by the laws of God and judge righteously. We want righteous judges, right? Christian or non-Christian, we want righteousness to reign, don't we? That's important to God. It certainly is. And people will always trot out the maxim, the, the America is not a Christian nation. And I would say principally, yes. But if our judges and our leaders were wise, they would fear the Lord. And they would govern in a way that is consistent with his standards. Even many of our non-Christian founding fathers had a sense of what it was to respect and fear the Lord, even though many of them were believers and loved Christ dearly. Third, worship the Lord with reverence. Now we start to see moving toward an evangelistic end. God commands nations to worship and to fear him. So this message, this gospel message, that Christ is, is Lord of all, that Christ is the Savior of the world, that message goes out to all people. And then we see number four, rejoice with trembling. Exult in the Lord. Instead of hating the Lord Jesus Christ, all nations are to celebrate him. And do so, he says, with trembling. After all, Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And rather, fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so, my friends, instead of being afraid of what people might say about Christ, remember that he commands all people everywhere to worship him, to rejoice in him, and to believe the gospel. I don't care what law, what country, what situation, you are always commanded and permitted by God to share and preach and proclaim the gospel and the testimony of the gospel. That never goes away. But then lastly, in verse 12, he says this, 
do homage to the Son, that he not become angry, and you perish in the way. Older translations of this render the first word kiss, kiss. And so the sentiment is this, kiss the Son, kiss the Son. What does this mean? Well, when visitors would come to a, a royal king's throne room, they would bow down and they would, they would kiss the ring on his hand. In Jesus' time, many people came down and, and bowed down and kissed his feet. It's a sign of submission. It's a sign of honor. It's a sign of worship and reverence. So how do you kiss the Son and do homage to the Son? Well, first, you must confess your sins to him and believe on him for salvation. And that's, that's not just something that believers did once and got saved and now they're all set. Now, this is something that we, we live in, a, in a, a posture of being repentant over sin. And so we are to confess our sins and honor him and say, Lord, you are right in your righteousness and I am wrong when I sin. You acknowledge, you submit to the Lord in that way. And trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for sins. And to turn from those sins and trust in him. But then you worship and you serve him. That's how you kiss the Son. You worship Him. You serve Him. You honor Him. You praise Him. And what is the takeaway? He says, for His wrath, God's wrath, may soon be kindled. So that's a warning. But then look how He lands the whole thing. This is, this is our comfort, beloved. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. We're blessed if he is our refuge and our strength, right? The Bible tells us that Jesus is coming back. In fact, he's coming soon at an hour we don't expect. We have no idea when he's coming. Anytime someone tries to predict it, they're always wrong. And they will be wrong until the end because even Jesus tells the disciples, nobody knows except the Father. But when he comes, his wrath will be kindled against those who reject him. But for those who take refuge in him, They will be blessed. They will be blessed. So, beloved, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Don't be afraid. Don't be anxious. And I told our church even this morning when I spoke on a a similar thing. When the Lord gives you opportunity to use your voice or use your vote or use your opportunity, you take your God-given opportunity to do so. But your faith does not rest in what's here. Your faith rests in the God who delivers all. God is the sovereign. Place your hope not here on the earth. Colossians 3, lift your eyes upward, gaze upward. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. Steady your heart. And when you see the nations rage, and they are, and they will, know that the Lord laughs at them because it's coming in flaming fire. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving kindness to us. We thank you for speaking to us through Psalm 2. And Lord, we we tremble, I know I tremble, at the thought of a coming judgment one day. But the Bible also says that we're blessed if we take refuge in you. And so Lord, let our message ever and always be to seek you. And Lord, I, I pray for these saints here at Reformation Bible Church. I thank you that you've given them a shepherd who loves them and elders who desire to lead them and care for them. And Lord, I pray that every single heart here has a relationship, a love, a submission to you as sovereign Lord. And I would even pray, Lord, that if there is even a person here tonight, I don't know, but if there's a person who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that they would turn from their sin and and see their need for the Savior, repent and turn away from that, and trust alone in Jesus Christ and find salvation now. So, Lord, we know that you have promised to preserve us. We know that you have promised to deliver. You've promised to save. And so, Lord, we are your church. We are your beloved. We look only to you for our salvation. And so we praise your name. We give you all honor, all glory, You are the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth. We praise you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and Savior. Amen.